So I was 42 years old when I came here. I am now 61. 19 years to be the pastor here. I'm thankful for those opportunities that God gave me. My family is here. And I'm glad for that. My dad, my brother, um, my in-laws, three of our sons and two wives. I'm grateful for their presence. They encourage me and love me. We need our families. So today, I've done a short series of sermons on in saying goodbye and in looking at um, some of the, the darkness that you can feel or think of as change takes place and not really knowing what the future has. But also, by faith reaching into the future, knowing that God has a future for us and what a wonderful future it is. And last Sunday we looked at the seasons of life, how both as individuals and as a church we grow and change and we start out as a child, a baby, and work through um, those childhood years and teen years into adulthood and uh, our work, working life and retirement and then death. And how each of those are designed by God and he blesses them. And churches have the same kinds of um, seasons of life. And we need to recognize and embrace those and accept what God does and how he directs. And so today, as um, I think about in saying goodbye to you, there's unfinished business. And that's what I want to look at today. Looking at Deuteronomy chapter 34 from the life of Moses... In essence, there's 12 verses there, and I'm not going to read all of them, but I want to focus on verses 4 and 5 of Deuteronomy 34. And the Lord said to him, Moses, This is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you will not cross over into it. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab, as the Lord had said. Let's pray. God, just come to us in these moments because you're a great God. And you're good to us all the time. Your ways we don't often understand or know what will result in in them but you call us to a life of faith and we seek to do that even as we look at Moses this morning God draw some parallels to us and to our lives you're a God that has a beginning and has no end and yet in various parts of our life there is a beginning and an end and you lead us to a logical conclusion and you've had done some wonderful things and you are doing wonderful things and there will be wonderful things yet thank you for all of that and for what you have taught us over the years And so we just receive from you in these ways and just ask even this morning that you would um, allow us to see you in important and different ways for Jesus' sake. Amen. There's a picture that was painted in the 1800s of Moses standing on a high ridge 
and looking into the promised land. He's standing there alone by himself. And when you see the picture, you're very much aware that we, as viewers, are standing in the promised land. We're already there. And we're looking back and seeing him. And they're back remembering standing in that presence, what it was like before, what, it, what is it like now. They're in a place of promise he didn't get to. They're enjoying the blessing of the lush land that God has given them, but they're thinking of the desert that they lived in for so long. They're looking, thinking about the rich foods that they're eating that the land produces in this new place and thinking about the leeks and onions that they had day after day in Egypt. Big contrast. There's natural game now in this land and before they just continually had sheep. And instead of the crowded conditions of Egypt and tight quarters in an urban kind of setting for that day, there's land everywhere you can see. Green land. Wonderful land where you can spread out. And today on a hill overlooking that ancient city of Jericho, you can see eastward into the plains of Moab, and somewhere in there is the, the burial of Moses, and nobody knows where. And somewhere out there um, is his grave. He led the Israelites for 40 years of his 120 years, trying to unite a nation of 400 men, or 4 million men, plus all their wives and children. And he saw where he was trying to take them, but never reaching the goal. How frustrating would that be to him? And like us, Moses has to learn to deal with unfinished business. My mother would sometimes say to my dad, um, when there is an event to go to in the evening, we can't go just yet, I'm going to finish up the dishes, it'll just take a few minutes, because she never wanted to come home to a dirty kitchen. Just a few minutes, but it was unfinished business if you didn't take care of it. Or you're getting on a plane for your vacation or your business trip, and you sit there and you think, oh, I forgot whatever it was. Unfinished business. Or you're working out in the yard and you realize you have a meeting to go to and you kind of lost track of time and you just got to throw down the rake and go. There's unfinished business. Today I leave Heart of the Lakes and there's some unfinished business. We'll talk about some of that a little bit later. But I want to make some, some parallels. There was reasons for Moses why he was stopped before reaching the goal of the promised land. And they're not big reasons, and yet we want to look at them just for a few moments. We're going to mention them here, that one of them is age. He was 120 years old, as it says in Deuteronomy 31. Then Moses went out and spoke these words to all of Israel. I am now 120 years old, and I'm no longer able to lead you. The Lord has said to me, you shall not cross the Jordan. So the Lord told him the time was done. The second reason Moses was stopped was out of disobedience. Striking the, the rock to get water when God said, I want you to speak to the rock. It seems pretty insignificant to us. But he says, on that day, the Lord told Moses, this is because you broke faith with me in the presence of the Israelites at the waters of Meribah in the desert of Zin, and because you did not uphold my holiness among them, the Israelites. The way things were done, when God is specific and gives direction, need to be done his way. And when we don't do things his way, there are some consequences and some results that we don't always like. That's the second reason. The third reason is he, there was sin in the people that he led. These four million men and women and children, they'd wrestled with the idea of worshiping idols. 
The Israelites wanted to be like everyone else around them. How much like that are we? You know, our culture talks and we want to go with the culture. We want to do what they do. Either way, the, the fact remains that the main goal of Moses, that he had spent a third of his life trying to do, was denied him. And he died there with unfinished business. Things happen in life that cause us to think about the unfinished business of life. When people die in our, in our family or friends, we think about some unfinished business. In our own church in the last year and a half, we think of Larry Praisner and Nancy Bowers and Sandy Cowan and Barb and Charlie Burkholder who have gone on. And I've thought at different times what unfinished business they had because many, many of them, it was just a surprise. Some people have a little bit of time because of disease or whatever to think about what unfinished business they have. We realize how quickly things change and life is fragile. And am I doing the things I need to do? We think about it through national events like 9-11 that most of us live through that just shock us and pull us back for a moment. We think of the Sandy Hill School shootings. We think of the mass killings in the theater in Colorado. We think of the Japan tsunami several years ago, of the recent rain and mudslide in Southern California, and even this weekend of Hurricane Patricia. And just think about how quickly things happen all over the world, and it changes life, and there's unfinished business, and it's done. It's just done. Events like these and Moses' experience on Mount Nebo remind us of one of these characteristics of human existence. That no matter when or how we leave or die, there will be unfinished business. Not right or wrong, not good or bad, it's just a fact of life. And so some of the business that's left unfinished will be important business and some of it's Pretty unimportant business. I want to take just a few examples from history just for us to think about again. If you think of music and Mozart or John Lennon, Mozart died at 35. John Lennon, I think it was 40. There have been numerous musicians died at very young ages for whatever reasons, but you always wonder what more music could have been produced had they lived longer. Abraham Lincoln died a week, less than a week after the Civil War ended. And it was a huge, enormous um, effect on the country as far as reconstruction. It slowed things down. And the integration of black people into culture, it just put the brakes on. It was unfinished business. Martin Luther King awakened a conscience within us as, as a nation and his principles of nonviolence toned down both extremes calling for this or for that. And when he died at 39 years of age, assassinated, a lot of his influence was lost. And the pain that America was already feeling, we were kind of wondering what's going to happen with this violence thing now. The, the voice was quieted. And of course, there's Jesus Christ crucified at 33 years of age. How many more sermons could he have preached? How many more people could he have healed? We have numerous accounts in the Bible, but there are more sick people. There are more people needing him. How many broken lives could he still put back together had he lived longer? How many more lessons could he have taught or subjects could he have covered but in all of those situations, in all of those situations, God determined at some point, it's enough. So how do we react to unfinished business? As human beings, I want us to look at that just briefly. Human reaction to this unfinished business. We don't like loose ends. We're taught very early in life to complete the things you start. 
Only take as much food as you're going to eat. We're not throwing it out. Don't start music lessons if you're going to quit in a few weeks. Don't try out for a team unless you plan to go through the whole season. Don't start college unless you plan to graduate. Don't get married if it's not for a lifetime. Those are all just kind of lessons continually given to us that we don't like loose ends. What we're taught is that success demands we stick to the task until it's done. And we often have a low opinion of people who start something and don't finish it. And there are some people we look at and we just think, they always start stuff, but what do they accomplish? They just give up and move on. Start something else. Give up and move on. What good is that? It's a good rule of life not to start something if you can't finish it. But there's, there's also another side of the coin that none of us accomplish everything we want to accomplish. No matter how long we work or how hard we work or how committed we are to finishing something. I'm leaving some unfinished business. I would have liked to establish a, a small group ministry that was long lasting. We have lots of Bible studies that kind of come and go, but something that lasts and connects us with each other on an ongoing basis. Could I preach more sermons? Sure. Can I cover more subjects? Can I visit more people in the hospital? Are there individuals yet to be saved? Certainly. But at some point, God says, I'm winding down your time. And it will come to conclusion. And that's by design. So I believe that part of coming to the end of or coming to the terms of life, learning to come to terms with some of these loose ends is what we need to do. And if we're trying to live successfully, there will never be a time when we've reached all of our goals and we can just say, look at that, wow. Aren't I good? As soon as we achieve one thing, we start thinking about something else that needs doing, that we would like to do. And as long as we live, there's going to be places you want to visit or return to or new books you want to read or another subject you want to investigate because you've heard about and it's kind of piqued your curiosity and you want to go there a little bit more and find out more. Or there's always another dessert to consume. <laughs> if we're really living, we'll come to the end of our life with some unfinished business because it means we're still living. So I want to finish with some observations about this unfinished business. The first is that we can and we need to reduce some of that unfinished business. And of course there will always be these loose ends that we could never totally tie up, but however, however careful we might be and even work at it, some of them, there are some things we really need to pay attention to. We will never take care of everything, but there is stuff that goes on and we never know when we're going to die. And shouldn't there be some times when we think, okay, with that unknown, I suppose I really need to address some things with some people. Some things we don't have to worry about because they kind of take care of themselves. It just kind of happens through life and we think, oh, Good, I don't have to deal with that. That's done and over with. It just kind of took care of itself. But I'm thinking about things like relationships. It's probably true that if we died this minute, there would be somebody who would desperately want to hear and that we need desperately to say something to. Those loose ends where we can and we should tie them up, who is it in your life that you, that you know need to hear things like, I love you, or I'm sorry, or I'm proud of you, or I forgive you, or I need you, or will you forgive me, or I really appreciated what you've done. Those are meaningful things to people. 
you know it because when they are done to you, you think, that was really nice. There are some loose ends that we can take care of and that we should. So who is that person? Forgiveness is one of those, as I've mentioned, and not the only one, but it's a really big one and a hard one for us to deal with. But Jesus teaches us in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us, Lord, as we, as we forgive others. Whoever it is, do it. Whatever it is, say it. And do it today. Don't let another day pass. There probably won't be a better time. And there might not be a time. That's some of the business we shouldn't let go unfinished. And just think about ways in which love can rule. I'm thinking, too, of doing the things that you've said maybe are on your bucket list. You know, the list of things that you want to do before you die. Things you want to do for pure enjoyment, or maybe it's for growth, or maybe it's for personal enrichment. There are things that maybe will take just a little effort on your part. Not a big thing. It's within your reach. Do it. When are you going to? Next year? When you retire, those famous words? Do you not know? Do you know for sure that you're going to be around 10 years from now? Or at retirement? Will your health allow you to do the things you want to do? You can't count on it. Will your mental capacity be in a place where you can deal with some of those things? It might not. If you want to do something and it's within your reach, Start moving in that direction. Don't leave those unfinished business where you think, ah, I wish it would have. A second observation is, is to work toward your goals, whether you actually reach them or attain them or not. Maybe you've heard the story of two boys who are digging a hole to China because they want to go there. And so with great dedication for several days, they dig this big hole and they're just having the time of their life and they're finding bugs and they're finding things that maybe were buried in the earth and they're making discoveries. And some bigger boy in the neighborhood always comes by and looks, what are you doing? Well, we're digging a hole to China. You're never doing that. So what if we don't get to China? Look at what we've discovered on the way. Don't accept that maybe you failed when you don't reach your goal perfectly. Who's perfect? There's nothing wrong with having high goals. Maybe you wanted to graduate from college with a perfect four point. Most of us could never really think that that would be possible. But the first time you get an A minus, how do you react? Does that just shoot the air out of your balloon totally and you want to give up? Well, I'm not going to reach it now. Might be true. But what was the point of going to college? Learning. Learning as you go. Discovering things about the world you didn't know about before. And if that's happening, isn't there value in that? Take pride in your accomplishment, whether you graduate summa cum laude or not. Goals are good through any areas of life, but sometimes we're so focused on doing it perfectly that we fail to learn along the way. We're just focused on perfection. Don't fail to see the beauty on the way. There's a lot that accompanies a project or a goal, and, and we could, we should celebrate the progress. Sometimes we need to stop a moment and look back and think, look at where I've come. Look at what life was like five years ago or ten years ago and look at where God's brought me. Wow. Thank you, God. I didn't think that I could do whatever it is or get through whatever it is. 
there's some very difficult things that each of us face in life and that makes us stronger and it makes us more resilient and we're a better person because we've actually dealt with that. You probably made some really good friends as a result of having struggled through and they've offered you some advice or some help or just the physical presence of being there. Whether we really reach our goal or not. What's your unfinished business spiritually? It's not a part of your outline, but I put that in here this morning. Are there goals that you're thinking about that you would like to do or be, learn? Has God been speaking to you about certain things? Has he been talking to you specifically about your relationship with him and how you need to receive that forgiveness? And you've heard little bits and pieces, but it hasn't happened yet. That's unfinished business. And friends, it needs to be taken care of. And today's a great day to do it. God determines how completely we've fulfilled our purpose, wherever it is that we're, we are at and that we're leaving. God determines the value of it. I want to look at 1 Corinthians 3.13. I really begin at verse 10, the second part. But each of us should be careful how he builds. For no one can lay a foundation other than the one already laid, which is Christ Jesus. And if any man builds on this foundation using gold and silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. God's going to look at our work. Doesn't matter what we think about it, doesn't matter what other people think about it. God's going to be looking at it and saying, What have you really done? And so, if we go back to Moses for just a minute, we look at him and we think, How tragic to have led these people all this way and not be able to really be a part of the end picture, the goal. He was allowed to see it, but not touch it, not walk into it. And if we're so goal-oriented as most of 21st century America is in some way, it seems tragic to us, but to God? Again, that's what we're concerned about. What does God think? And going to Deuteronomy 34, verses 10 and 11, we hear what God thinks about Moses. And he says, there is no one like him. He says, since then, since Moses, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, who did all these miraculous signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh, to all the officials, and to his whole land. There's nobody like him. Yeah, he had some barriers that prevented. But God still said, he was a great man. You see, the Bible, or God, has other criteria to evaluate the life of a person. As humans, we evaluate by those physical things. How much how prominent this person is or how much prestige or power this person has or how much wealth do I see which is an evidence of their value, we think. The Bible says that human success is this, conforming to God's will. It doesn't say anything about prominence or wealth or power. But did this man conform to the will of God? Did this woman? And by that standard, the life of Moses was successfully completed. And Jesus said, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Ephesians 5.17 says, Therefore don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Don't be foolish, friends. Don't know the Lord's will? Talk to him about it. Seek him. Go after it. 
It might take some time, but the will of the Lord is important. God values your and my conforming to his will. And looking at the life of Jesus from a purely human standpoint, we often think it's sad how brief his life was. Just 33 years old. We often wonder what he might have accomplished had he been given another 20 years or 30 or 40. Nobody knows. He doesn't, it doesn't make any difference. What matters is, are we devoted to God? Is that our focus? Be thou my vision, God. Jesus spent his entire life in obedience to the Father's will. And Jesus says in John 9, as long as it's day, we must do the work of him who sent me. As long as there's possibility, as long as the sunlight is shining, as long as I have strength and energy, as long as God gives me breath, we need to be doing the will of God. Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Whatever goals you have, whatever you want to in, um, attain in life, don't work at it for the approval of other men or for the prestige that you might receive, but do it as to the Lord. What does he want? He's not concerned about those things other than, are you conforming to my will? I've been talking to you about this, Kevin. So at the end of Christ's life, in his last breath, he says, it's finished. What was finished? Everything that he wanted to do in life? Was every dream and desire fulfilled in that life? Was every goal accomplished? Was every healing that he could have done, done? Was every blessing he could have given, given? No, of course not. Jesus is like us. He had some unfinished business when life came to its end. And he took care of his business after the resurrection, before the ascension, took care of some of it. The Holy Spirit took care of more, more of it at Pentecost. And every time that the Holy Spirit calls a person to come follow me, he's fulfilling his purpose. What he came to do to secure a way in heaven for me and you that was accomplished and God's will was done in Christ's life. Even though it was short, even though there are things yet to be done, he fulfilled that purpose. So today's my last day and there are some things I haven't finished. I've done what I could in different ways and in God's way he is shown me the time is over. And so I haven't cleaned out my office. The books are still on the shelves. The files are still full of papers. I've got my computer files to go through and think about what would be helpful for the church to have, to be sent on in some form. What papers do I need to be left behind? You know, what will be needed, what will be helpful? That's a huge job after 19 years where you've just accumulated stuff. And I've tried every couple of years to go through some things and kind of keep it up, but wow. There's stuff that's just going to be unfinished, and I'm going to work at some of that. But if, you, if it was your last day, could you truthfully say, I've been conforming my life to the will of God? Have you tied up the loose ends that God might be speaking to you about? What loose ends you may have that you can do something about? Can you trust God with whatever you've left behind? For the Christian, you know, he calls us to a higher standard and sometimes it seems pretty high to us. And in fact, most of it, it simply means we're going to leave a lot of behind because we're human. 
and we're living life and we're living in his world and he offers us help and guidance and direction because he says, I have a will for you. Follow. Walk in it. Are you walking in it? Some of the ways that he calls us is hard. But it doesn't change the call or change the expectation. He just says, get going. So he invites us to do those things. And I invite you to do those things as he speaks to you as he has me. Let's pray. Just now, as I often do, I just want to give you time to think about these thoughts before we rush on to other things. So if you just bow your heads and think this morning about some business that God has addressed even as you've been here this morning. And what do you need to do about it? Talk to him now. So, Father, we love you. We ask for your power to help us do what we need to do as your spirit speaks to us in these ways. For Jesus' sake, amen. Okay. Is my mic on? Pastor, I'm just going to ask you to hang on for a second. We, first of all, thank you for your kind words and the challenges, um, taking us into God's mind and his will us as a church and as individuals and uh, we have some unfinished business that we would like to take care of with you as well and so I'm going to ask if you would just have a seat with Sharon for a minute and then I'll call you back up <clears throat> Pastor Matt would you grab would you grab your family and come on up here now I understand we've gone a little bit long today and we are going to go a little longer because today's an unusual day for us so just be patient and bear with us what's that okay Matt tells me Jody's down in nursery, so we can excuse her if she can't get here, but anyway, Pastor Matt and jo Jody and his family joined us just a year ago, and as I remember lear learning in pastoral ministry studies years ago, when a pastor shows up at a church, he needs to give the church at least a year before they'll begin to trust. So you've had a year. It's been a good year, and Matt has done a tremendous amount of work for us. Oh, here comes Jody. Good. Come on up, Jody. The kids are jealous that you didn't clap for them when they came up. Come on and join us, Jody. Good. Um, <clears throat> Pastor Matt has kicked off this 252 program this year, and it is starting to really take off. And we kind of did a beginning in the spring sort of a slow working into it and then I've officially said this fall let's get this ramped up and going wasn't that fun this morning with the kids so anyway Matt we thank you for that um, this is pastor appreciation month which we do every year and if you didn't realize this was going to be the last Sunday of the month and you haven't prepared a gift for them you can still do that just drop it by the office or give it to one of the ushers or whatever for either of our pastors but we do appreciate you guys Matt especially all the work that you've done lately and um, the Iwana program seems like it's just starting to click and kick. And you've got some, yeah, I know, you're working with some good helpers. And, and anyway, we're, Sharon's in nursery and taking over for Jody. Okay. So in years past, we've asked you to, to give uh, gift cards because the pastors really enjoy those. This year, 
because of some information, we decided we were just going to do cash gifts. And so we have a cash gift from you, from your congregation. We would like you to, to bless your family with somehow. Can you do that? Would you express your appreciation and love for our family? Zachary, Jake, and Kristen. I didn't mention their names, the kids. <laughs> uh, Pastor Kevin, could you and Sharon come back up, please? Pastor appreciation. It's kind of hard to do this time. But we do appreciate you. And your congregation has a gift for you um, for the same thing. This, this past year since last when you've continued to bless us, minister to us, and represent our Lord in a way that makes us proud as a church in this, in, and in this community. So i got to figure out what I did with the card. So, <laughs> And here is a card. And likewise, cash gift for you to enjoy. And we thank you so much, my love, and our love. Please stay here for a minute. I've got a couple more things. I have a couple more things yet. You can be seated. It'll just be a second. And I apologize for not mug, uh, hugging Matt, but he, he and I, I was afraid we'd just blend right together and mesh. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, Kevin and Sharon know about this. Um, they've been here 19 years with us, as Kevin mentioned. And that's as long as our founding pastor was here. And we have a portrait of uh, Milam and Margaret hanging here in the building. We decided that we would like to have that to hang alongside. That's your, your legacy that you've left here with us to remember these 19 years of your service. So I would like to present this in honor of Pastor Kevin and Sharon. As I understand it, um, Pastor Kevin and Sharon have smaller copies of this, but we would also like you to know we would like to get you a framed of whatever size you would like for your home. Just let us know. We'll talk to you about that later, okay? And also, this from your church, and we kind of went around and asked your family and your kids and kind of get an idea of something we could do to bless you, especially as a in, a, in, in your departure. So as a parting gift, I better get my notes so I can remember all this. this. This is a reservation that we have made for you at a three-night... Well, I've got my glasses on. I use only for this music thing, and I can't see now if I get... But anyway... Um, we're sending you on a three-night stay to Bowling Green, Kentucky. They have there, which we think you'll enjoy, Kevin, a Corvette Museum. There's a Lost River Cave to explore, an aviation park, a river walk, an antique mall. We've also included for you as much money as you would need to spend so you don't have to worry about spending. And some other people in the congregation have added to that. So just bless yourselves and enjoy that time, would you? Okay. All right. One more round of, hand, of applause for our dear pastor and his wife. We love you family, too, as well. You can go back down. Sheila. You can go on back down now. Yeah. Sheila would like to bring a blessing to bestow on her pastor and wife. The song was a surprise, and the Lord reminded me of it. Uh, I sang it for pastor appreciation, probably in about 2009, and it's called The Blessing. 
and he wanted me to share it, and I found out about it uh, yesterday. <laughs> so thanks to John and Cindy for helping, and we pray that this would bless Pastor and Sharon and everyone in attendance here. face shine on you and be gracious to you and may his mercy follow you and give you peace receive his peace he is the only God our Savior who showers us with favor we know all his promises are true he is the awesome Yes, we do love you, Pastor Kevin and family. If you don't know, we're having an open house beginning now until 3 o'clock at the other end. You're all welcome to be there and spend this time with, with the family. And 
Uh, did anybody come any farther than Mexico to be here today? <laughs> no way I noticed is here, and that's, that's great. So, um, <laughs> yeah, we're glad to have you. Just a little bit of instruction before I close in prayer, and that is that there will be an open mic down at the other end, so you'll have a chance to share uh, as much as you want of um, your stories with Pastor Kevin and give him your love and so on. So please plan to do that. Stay with us. There's plenty of food. We've had it catered, and some of you have brought, I guess, desserts, and of course, um, that's my favorite part too, Kevin. Um, one word of instruction, when I conclude the prayer, I would like to Kevin, if you would be prepared to usher your family out, and we'll follow you down. That way you can begin the line and be finished eating so you can begin to visit and, and whatnot. So would you be kind enough to stay in your seats after the word amen just long enough to let Pastor and his family reach the rear? And then let's go down there and party, okay? All right. Let's pray. Father, it's been a blessed morning to know, uh, know and to see your love again shed upon us. We do bless your name and praise you for being our God. I thank you for Pastor Kevin and his message. And I ask that you'll work with each one of us through the power of your spirit as we take on the challenge of not leaving unfinished business that would, could result in someone missing your grace and your love. I ask that you'll draw us together as a body in the days ahead as, uh, as we face uncertainty. Lord, I pray especially for Pastor Kevin. I thank you for the peace that he has shared that you've given him in this process. But oh, how we'd love if you would begin to reveal your will and, and bless him and his family as they go from here. We thank you for the food we'll, we're about to partake of. We ask that you'll bless our conversation and time together. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Kevin, would you lead us out?